Hey thinkers, welcome to this week's Thinking Podcast by Human. I'm your host, Jeffrey Wu. And I'm really excited to have entrepreneur and chemical and biological engineering or engineer by training, Jasmina Aganovich on our show today. Um, welcome. Thanks for having me. Excited to be chatting with you today. So one of the big areas of excitement is around the microbiome. Uh, I think one of these interesting tidbits is that there are more biome, gut microbiome, skin microbiome cells than human cells in our, in our, in our, in, in, in our bodies. So in a lot of yeah. ways, it's like a forgotten organ. And that's something that you and your, uh, I'd love to, you know, you should talk about your business and, and the areas that you're, you're looking at, but it's something that you're actively sure. working on. So, um, please, yeah, yeah, happy to have you on the show. Yeah, yeah. Uh, happy to give a, a history of, uh, of our company and kind of why we are in the space that we are. Um, it, you know, for any of the entrepreneurs that are uh, listening, um, you know, I'm sure that the path never ends up in the place that you expect it to be. And ours is certainly uh, that type of a story. Um, it's interesting that you use the word forgotten organ. Um, some people are calling it the new organ system. Um, they feel like it's the new organ system that's been discovered uh, in fact, some people are saying, you know, we thought that we had discovered and learned everything that we possibly could on Earth. <laughs> and that space exploration is really, you know, the next frontier. Uh, and yet, you know, here it is, this invisible world that was literally right under our nose the entire time that we know very little to, to nothing about. So opening with that as just a general statement that there's some that we know, but there's a lot that we don't. Uh, and what we talk about as a company is uh, making one of our core values, speaking not beyond the science, right. um, being very direct and upfront on what we know, what's still conjecture, where we believe things can go, but really not um, talking past the science. So it's definitely a really fascinating space. Um, it's been a huge learning experience for me as well. And just seeing how the general public and academia uh, together have been responding to it has been uh, it, it's just a really interesting time. Yeah, I think that's I think that's right. I, I think when you know our we I mean personally just looking at the space, it seems that there's very promising indications for certain types of uses. I mean, from the very very therapeutic side, looking at fecal transplants, right? Like basically yeah. gut transplants of uh, someone with a healthy uh, gut microbiome, someone that's sick. You, you, you do see interesting clinical case studies where people get really great outcomes. And I think uh, the science is emerging and I think quite promising around how do we optimize for uh, different microbiomes for different use cases, whether that's for skin, whether that's for athletic performance, cognitive performance. I mean, it seems like, uh, you know, it is like a very uh, tied in organ system that affects all these different types of, you know, existing sort of quote unquote human normal systems. Right, right, absolutely. I think the other thing that's been surprising to me uh, has to do with the speed with which interest is taking place and also with which it's being folded into not just rhetoric within the academic communities, but students right. today. Um, so I, I, uh, I went to MIT. I graduated not that long ago ago in 2009. And so I still help out uh, with some programs that, that I'm really passionate about there uh, with some of their engineering programs. And they are already folding in the microbiome mm -hmm. into their curriculum for specific courses. And that's really interesting to me because uh, the microbiome was not something that was talked about at all. Uh, when I was at when I was at school, and for it to be basically less than ten years later, and for it already to be folded into the undergraduate basic curriculum, I think is a recognition of Hey, there's a lot that we don't know, but there's there's going to be something right. here, and it's really important that you start learning about it now. Yeah. Um, so it's uh, it's 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 surprising, um, but I think in good ways. Yeah. So you hinted at this interesting personal journey and how you got uh, involved in productizing, commercializing, you know, understanding the the the, the scope of the mi the microbiome world. Yeah. What is that personal story? I know that you run a company called Mother Dirt that's involved in yeah. uh, productizing biome research. Uh, what is that? Yeah. What is that personal story for you? Yeah. So as I, as I alluded to before, chemical and biological engineering uh, was really what I, what I studied. I was always fascinated by consumer products and specifically how something that is more technical is 
translated into a physical product that people interact with. Uh, that was a puzzle that I found to be really interesting. And definitely, I, I guess it's my engineering brain that turns on. It's how do you translate, 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 and not move too far away from the original story. Um, consumer products just happened to be a field that I was really interested in. Um, I could be a lot of reasons for that. We're it could be consumers. because I was <laughs> right. Yeah. We, yeah, we, we all are. Um, so that was why I, I headed down, uh, that, that direction, uh, worked at a few, a few different brands, both on the product development and the R and D side, uh, started to get more of, um, a reach into marketing and sales as I started to become really curious about how the work that I was doing in the lab was getting translated to the end consumer and what was driving those decisions. Uh, and about four years ago, I decided to take uh, some time off, did a bunch of traveling. Uh, and towards the end of that, um, I met the folks here at AO Biome. It was at that time, I think just two people, three people. Wow. Uh, they were working with this bacteria that had once existed on human skin. And they were doing clinical research specifically for wound healing. Uh, but there were a lot of questions about the impact of modern chemistry, uh, personal care products on this class of bacteria. Uh, it's very sensitive to surfactants um, and it's obviously very sensitive to preservatives. If you think about inherently what preservatives are intended to do, Kill they are supposed to prevent right. yeah, bacterial growth. So there is antimicrobial activity there. And so I was, I was talking to the team. Uh, uh, they were gearing up to do a very simple um, cosmetic clinical study that entailed 30 people uh, stopping use of all of their modern personal care products, taking water only showers, and then dousing themselves with this live culture of bacteria about twice a day. We measured, um, we measured a variety of endpoints, um, both uh, visual endpoints, so um, uh, what their skin was looking like, what their skin was feeling like, benefits that they perceived. So there were some things that weren't necessarily quantitative. Um, and then we also sequenced. Uh, their skin microbiomes. And uh, that was a, a little bit of um, the beginning of what we were doing. I think we had a lot more questions than we did answers at that time. But the mentality and this interesting snapshot I'm giving you was when I was interviewing with the team and we were all trying to figure out if there was a role for me or if that was what I wanted to do with my career and blah, blah, blah. Right. So what ended up happening, uh, one of the participants of that study wrote uh, an article in the New York Times about this experience that she had. Um, she gave it an incredibly cheeky title. Uh, it was like, my no soap, no shampoo, bacteria rich hygiene experiment. Um, the article uh, went live Memorial Day weekend of 2014. And it was, I think, the top five most circulated article for the New York Times for uh, about 40 days. Wow. Um, so this generated so much interest, uh, at this time where I was talking to the company about what direction they could take their research in, uh, and where our conversations landed was with the fact that this article and its widespread interest had shown that there's a huge market, it wasn't just, right? Like you basically that, yeah. that proved out the market essentially. Totally. Yeah. It wasn't just academics that were interested in it. It wasn't, it wasn't just researchers. The, 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 this had, um, our, our chief medical officer, Larry Weiss talks about this article having struck on an unarticulated need. Right. Um, and, uh, that really made us rethink how we structured the company. So the, where we landed with all of it has so much to do with where we are today, which is, Hey, there is, this is, this is hitting on some sort of chord that's out there. There is an important dialogue to be had here. We believe that this can fundamentally change how we view some fundamental elements of public health. Why not build a consumer products brand and use our products as a vehicle to have this conversation? So it's more about the conversation than it is about the products or revenue per se, but really what we would be doing is taking that revenue and funneling that to the clinical research that right. we're doing, which is where we started. So to date, we have two sides of our organization. We have the consumer facing side, which as we know today is, is mother dirt. And that's the side that I'm responsible for. And then the other side, which is clinical research. Um, and to date we're doing uh, two clinical studies with the FDA using this type of live bacteria as, um, as a potential drug. That's interesting. I think that's a lot of how I know. I think that's fascinating. Cause I think that's, I, I believe how consumer packaged goods company will look like in the future, where I think today most consumer product companies are marketing 
companies, right? Yeah. Like there's very little R and D. If you look at the balance sheets or their, you know, the, their financial statements, it's literally like the line yeah. item for marketing is like twenty, thirty percent, and like R and D is just like we're gonna make uh, organic version of like the shampoo or the or the or, yeah. or the Gatorade or or, or a sports drink. Um, and I, it, I, that always puzzled me as an entrepreneur as well. Like consumer packaged goods are a massive market and no one's actually doing fundamental research there. But if one were to do R&D as part of that span, and I think that will be long-term the best marketing yeah. one can have. So it so- sounds like essentially there's like a, a, a an arm of the organization that's uh, you know running clinical yeah. studies. And, and I, I presume that mother dude is like the primary licensee or or, 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 or or commercialization partner for some of the ip that's developed in the in the in the i guess the original company something like that is it was what i'm interpreting yeah so we um were uh, technically structured as as one company and one organization so there's no licensing that's happening okay. uh, mother dirt is really sort of the the brand but certainly we I have see. had conversations about how to legally structure this as uh the two sides of the business really start to grow um and yeah. over the last two years those conversations have been happening more and more often. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, going back to what you were talking about with R and D and, and, and science, you know, one of the things that I, um, you know, it's interesting to look at 2014 as a pivotal year in the world of the microbiome, particularly for the skin, we were already hearing about it for the gut, um, and probiotics had become more or less ubiquitous or something that was more commonplace, right? It had sort of, um, I wouldn't say saturated, but it wasn't, um, it wasn't an odd concept for people to think about. Uh, right. With the skin, um, you know, the idea of a live bacteria on your skin is a little bit odd. And in what what typically happens with skincare is trends from food uh, and other health oriented things eventually trickle into skincare. The delay is like six to nine months, depending on how rapidly that particular trend is is moving. And so, in the case of probiotics there was this fundamental mismatch from uh, a formulation and an R&D perspective, which is that products that sit on a shelf for skincare, so your moisturizer, your cleanser, it is standard protocol to put a preservative in that thing to make sure that it can sit on the shelf for two years. And there it immediately became possible for the skincare and personal care industry to not be able to interpret the word probiotic as the World Health Organization has defined it. So they sort of created their own interpretation of it, which is um, a, sometimes they use enzymatic byproducts, so not the actual microorganism Mm. um, itself. Sometimes they use lysates, so like sort of chopped up. It it isn't live bacteria by any means, but they use the word probiotic. So when we were launching the mist, we needed to make very key strategic decisions about the balance of our vernacular. Are we going to use probiotic? Are we going to use bacteria? Are we going to use microorganism? Because we didn't, despite the fact that we wanted people to feel comfortable with it, we didn't want to dilute the novel nature of what we had. Yeah, there's definitely some education, right? I think that's like the interesting thing with a lot of these emerging biological innovations coming into translating into the commercial market. Like, how do you educate people on nootropics, biohacking, you know, live bacteria? Um, I think one thing that struck me that was interesting was just looking from a historical trend, like the rise of soap Mm -hmm. and surfactants i mean that saved a lot of lives in terms of people you know washing their hands right and and that triggered like now the ubiquity ubiquity of all these antibacterial soaps hand cleansers body washes shampoos yeah and now it's almost it almost overreached essentially yeah and 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 we're in this like weird zone where like like the, I, I guess the classic ideal before would have been like, hey, everyone should have sterile skin. Yeah, but that is just impossible given right. that everything has some back surface bacteria. Right. So like we're stripping right. like the natural defenses. So I think it's like interesting from a historical perspective. Like I think yeah. that very much aligns with a lot of the, our conversations around intermittent fasting mm-hmm. or ketogenic diets, where I think a lot of our listeners who are fasters, I mean, fasting was not considered fasting a thousand years ago it was just right. like normal eating patterns right like there was feast no option, and famine right? periods yeah. right <laughs> yeah and we were designed to sort of like shift burn through our glycogen stores get into ketosis and, and and never have like this overload of readily available carbohydrate snacks on demand and i think it's yeah. a, a, it seems like it is very similar analog with 
skin and bacteria. Yeah. Yeah. You know, a, a few important things to, to add on to that. Um, you know, when we, I mentioned earlier that uh, we believe that this bacteria once existed on human skin, that it was a natural right. commensal, which is another thing that makes it different from other skin probiotics out there is that it's not the acidophilus, it's not the lactobacillus. These are probiotics. These are bacteria that are typically known in yogurt and food, but there's no, uh, nothing evolutionarily to point to the fact that it once colonized human skin, that it was once naturally part of the, the skin's ecosystem. So there's that, um, there's that element to it. But, you know, the, the, the recency with which we believe we lost this bacteria is, is not as long ago as you think. We believe it's about 50 to 75 years. So we're not even talking much more past a single generation. And right. so if you start to look at the rates with which was the catalyst was the catalyst like this notion of hygiene that yeah like like soap soap culture like hygiene culture so we uh, we jokingly refer <laughs> it, so you're familiar probably with the germ theory of disease so basically it's sure. bacteria causes disease and now the whole microbiome space is starting to prove that that's probably not the case so we are starting to play with this term the germ t- theory of health so this idea that um, microorganisms are a crucial part of a healthy ecosystem and that also the human body is not nearly as siloed as the modern medical system has made it, uh, has made it be. So uh, the, the recency uh, has a lot to do with how our lifestyles have changed. Um, and so I know biohacking touches on this a, a ton. If you think about how we once lived as human beings, we were way more immersed in our external environment, in our natural environment. In the dirt, essentially. In the dirt, right? So we were, I mean, walking barefoot, swimming in lakes, rivers, and streams. But the whole point is we were outside. And this exposure to the outdoors was like a mini inoculation every single time we went outside. So we've reduced significantly our exposure to the outdoors. And on top of that, we've integrated uh, these uh, products into our daily routines. Um, A lot of modern chemistry, some of which has come with benefits, right? So hand washing is something that no one will ever contest, right? A really important advancement in uh, in human health. And there's nothing about any of what we talk about that is trying to get people to move away from hand washing. But when you take rigorous hygiene routines and you start applying it to every part of your body, that's when it gets into exactly what you had said, which is sort of overshooting and taking it a little bit too far. And where we end up, and I think the reason the article resonated with so many people is that we're technically cleaner than ever, and we have more product options than ever, and yet we have more inflammatory skin diseases than we ever did before. I think the United States consumes 80% of the world's prescription medication for acne. So um, there's some That's pretty insane. astounding uh, statistics that are, are not where you would expect to have us end up considering the fact that, you know, people have been following what they have been told in terms of cleanliness and hygiene. Yeah, I think, I think when we look at the historical context, I think it's always interesting to just like, f- figure out the historical drivers on a lot of these things. I think, yeah, from a from a local sense, it makes sense to sort of optimize and clean, clean, clean. But it seems like on the on the macro scale, like the end outcomes are, are often that, like today, like like very much worse, yeah, and more expensive, right? And and I think you see that across all of healthcare with all the debates of Obama, Trump care, what 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 not. I mean, I think just a lot of people right. are just sort of looking at, hey, our existing notions aren't quite working anymore. So I think it's, I think it's a just a broader, I almost like a populist revolution with with self-empowerment around how to questioning, you know, right. Yeah. Yeah. Questioning. Yeah. I think, I think it's absolutely right. I'm curious. So what, you know, can we, can we, can we, can we talk a little bit more about the specific bacteria that you guys have uh, discovered and and what was evidence? I'm I'm curious, like if this was on our skins 50, 75 years ago, how did it get rediscovered? Yeah. Uh, The story is, uh, (laughs) is really funny, Um, but great. Right. Uh, You uh, sort of end up in unexpected places. Um, so uh, David Whitlock, who is our scientific founder, uh, was on a date with a woman. Um, this is the true story, I promise. Uh, was on a date with a woman who is a horseback rider. And David is uh, very smart um, and knows that he is very smart uh, and prides himself on probably knowing the answer to any question you throw at him. So just to paint a picture on David, he's lovely, by the way. Um, and so she asked him, uh, why is it that my horses roll in the dirt? And David immediately thought it's because of the insects. And she said, no, 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 the insects don't come out until June, July, but they do this like clockwork in the springtime. Why is that? 
he found this question to be really interesting. And David has this uh, really um, lovely life philosophy that it doesn't matter who the questions are coming from, that sometimes the best questions can come from the most unexpected places. So he takes any and all questions very, very seriously. Uh, it was this question that catalyzed a series of explorations for him. So he realized shortly thereafter that it wasn't just horses that had this behavior of rolling in the dirt, that many mammals did. Uh, so if you look at dogs and cats and chickens, uh, every mammal virtually has some sort of ritual habit of rolling in the dirt. And he found this to be very interesting. I know most of us wouldn't necessarily, but the thought that was going through his head was, if they have evolved the need to do this over many thousands of years, it must be really important. Why is that? So he started looking for links between mammalian skin and soil. Uh, and one of the strongest links that he found, or the link that he found, was this class of bacteria that feeds off of the ammonia in our sweat. And this is the bacteria that we work with, uh, ammonia oxidizing bacteria. Um, it's a soil-based bacteria. Uh, it is present everywhere in nature that you find uh, ammonia being produced. So virtually anywhere that you have a nitrogen cycle taking place, ammonia is being produced as a, like a toxic byproduct and then being recycled back into that whole process. It's the ammonia oxidizing bacteria that play a really key role in continuing that cycle. If you were to somehow magically have an ammonia oxidizing bacteria magnet and you were able to suck them out of a potted plant, for example, that plant would soon die because there would be a lot of toxic buildup of the ammonia in, uh, in soil. So this bacteria is found everywhere uh, ammonia is found on the planet. It doesn't matter what ecosystem it is. It could be a glacier. Uh, it could be a, a hot spring. So it's ubiquitous. The only example of where this bacteria is not present where ammonia is, is modern human skin. So this is data point number one that we point to, that it is the only place on the planet where ammonia is being produced without uh, this class of bacteria being present. And if you back up a little bit and think about the things that we had just talked about a moment ago, if you think about how we as human beings once lived, um, it would make logical sense that it was once there too. So that's data point right. number one, what catalyzed David's series of, of discoveries. Um, data point number two has been validated by other research groups uh, 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 since then um, who have, with curiosity, gone to Aboriginal tribes. Um, swabbed and sequenced a variety of their microbiomes, and they have indeed confirmed that they are colonized with ammonia oxidizing bacteria. Mm, okay. And perhaps not surprisingly, um, <laughs> similar parallels exist in the gut, but they don't deal with many of the gut issues that many of us modern humans deal with. Um, and they also don't deal with the skin or inflammatory disorders that uh, many people in the developed world um, deal with. So um, that is sort of the, 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 the core bacteria that we look at and, and how, we were, how we were led to it. That's cool. So what are some of the uh, like performance measures? So, you know, putting the product to the test. So yeah. I, I, you, obviously you mentioned, I think, in the original clinical trial studies around some objective markers, some subjective markers. Like what are the, what are the most efficacious markers that you guys are most interested in? Yeah. So the, the first step that we did as a company is to try and understand the mechanism of this bacteria as much as, as, much as possible. And uh, to, to set it as a backdrop to, to what is now happening in the microbiome space or how our approach is different, um, it, does, it, it is worth pointing out because I think most companies in the microbiome space are focusing on a big data play. So it's, it's the first question that people have thought of with the microbiome is what is the perfect microbiome? What is a healthy microbiome and how can we replicate it? So that right. has started this very difficult search into data, right? It's like, how can we gather as much data as possible so that we can figure out what, what normal looks like and then start yeah, leaving like away biome, right? Like I think it's Correct. like essentially that's, they're becoming essentially, you know, very, you know, accessible uh, microbiome, gut microbiome tests, but data essentially focus. it's like a data play. Yeah. Right. So that has been the, the approach of, of most companies in, in that space. We are not necessarily interested in that big data picture. What we're starting with is like the opposite end. So you have big data here at the top and we are at like the, the, the small specific point where we are just looking at one type of bacteria. We right. understand what it consumes. We understand what it produces. And then we look at all of the disorders and the issues that are out there and we say, okay, based on what we know this does, 
which of these systems can we apply it to so that we right. can measure some sort of a perturbation in that right. system. So that that has largely been how we have approached um, uh, our clinical our clinical path. So a, a few examples to take you through. We knew that the bacteria consume ammonia and they produce uh, nitrite and nitric oxide. Um, uh, nitrite in the medical community is labeled as an antibacterial, ironically, uh, mm. and uh, nitric oxide is labeled as an anti-inflammatory. So back in 2014, that was what we knew of the mechanism. And we were like, where is antibacterial and anti-inflammatory most useful? Wounds. So forget the fact that we're applying a live bacteria to a, to a wound where, you know, typical convention is that that is not what you would want to do. But our first studies uh, started off being in, in wound healing. With the New York Times article that came out, we launched a small beta and we made the conscious decision to be very open and honest with our users that we knew some of the basics of what the product would do. We obviously knew that it was completely safe, so the equivalent of walking barefoot outside. Um, but we wanted their input on what they were seeing and what they were noticing. What does that mean from a regulatory perspective? Is like a generally regarded as safe? I know cosmetics is different from food. I'm, yeah. Like, like, I guess, I mean, there's, I think so, in, in the consumer, I'm, I'm just curious. Yeah, no, it's from a, a great yeah, question. From a regulatory perspective. Super controversial. <laughs> Right. So, um, you know, the, the, uh, the reason we were able to sell a live bacteria, um, we knew that it was safe and we were not making any drug claims on it. Right. So that's the criteria. All the claims that we made on the product were oriented around a cosmetic. So improving the look and feel of the skin and also odor claims, which are also considered to be cosmetic. And we knew that it was safe and we had a crap ton of safety data to be able to substantiate that. In fact, this class of bacteria has already been uh, uh, grass certified in, in Canada. So uh, there's a lot of safety data out there that, that, we, could, that we could point to. Um, and sense. by the way, we, um, I, you know, in, in a field that's so young uh, and for us, you know, being one of the few that's in it, we view ourselves as the stewards of this as a field. And so we feel like it's our job to not only do right by the science, but to do right by the regulatory bodies. I know right. that a lot of people think that our regulatory bodies are really slow and, you know, maybe too strict, but they're there for a reason and we need to be able to respect that process. And they are the ones that have dictated what that regulatory process needs to look like. And so we've been very transparent with the FDA about what we want to do. And we always err on the side of caution because it's more about the dialogue than it is about revenue for us. Absolutely. I mean, I so, think I, I think that's that's how you are long term successful, right? I think I think people that are trying to do short term short shortcuts, um, yeah, one can yeah, you might be able to get, like, get some revenue, flip you know flip for you know x million dollars, but if I think the long term thing will be some sort of regulatory and regulator and in industry collaboration on how to define a lot of these like enhancement yeah um, products that just just didn't exist in the, the previous paradigm of like medicine right drug. And then like food and like we don't really know. I think there's like emerging class of products that are super safe, super useful for, you know, that, that doesn't need to necessarily need like a doctor's prescription. Yeah, you might want, not want to say, hey, like these are necessarily drugs and, and making medical claims. But like there's like this interesting, like I would say like in between gray area that I think a lot of technologies are seeming to yeah you know, prop up into. Yeah. And, you know, what we worry about is if there is a, uh, you know, someone theoretically could, out of aggressiveness, sort of uh, set the field back, right? So if someone right. goes out there and says something that is way ahead of the science and it, it ends up being a big letdown, it's a letdown for those investors, it's a letdown for the public. So then the next right. company that comes up behind them is going to have to, you know, raise money and their potential future investors are going to say, well, look at what happened with that company. Like, right. no, 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 I'm, I'm really skeptical about that. And then the public is going to say, well, you know, they were all just lying. So yeah, you poison the well, right? Like it's just basically right. you, have to, you have to overcome like the, like the, the first person sort of, you know, right. fuck ups basically. Right, right. So yeah, we're, we're pretty, we're pretty mindful um, of that. So the okay. regulatory side of it, we've, uh, we viewed as incredibly important to, um, to our long-term success, our time horizon, as you've been mentioning, has been really, really long, and we are okay right. with it. Um, you know, it took us a really long time to get to this point with our views on hygiene. Um, it's very understandable that it will take a long time for us to start to reverse some of those original perceptions. Um, so, 
so in terms of I guess like the the results with the wound healings were oh, yeah. people saying yeah. just I guess like in terms of like wound healing like that's like I guess scar appearance I mean what were some of the interesting measures that came out of that initial study sure uh, so we were doing uh, safety studies on wound healing. Um, we never officially started FDA studies uh, on wound healing. And the reason we didn't is because of what started to happen on the consumer side. So we started this small beta, uh, had a lot of interest. We had a back order for about four months committed to data gathering. That was really all we cared about. We wanted to know how people were using the product and what they were noticing. And what we did is with that data is we started to notice that strong signal were emerging over similar things. So we started to see, as, as an example that I can talk about, uh, that acne uh, was a strong signal that was starting to emerge, uh, as in positive results on acne. Of course, this is not something that we market Mother Dirt for. This is what is there for the clinical side. So Mother Dirt right. is able to take this data across thousands and thousands of data points and say, hey, we're starting to see a really strong signal here. Why don't you guys look into it? They're able to look into this. They're able to reach out to those users, have conversations, and then structure uh, a, a more thorough study that is double-blinded, placebo-controlled, uh, to really explore this. And then based right. on those results, then we will either file an IND or choose not to pursue it. So an investigational new drug with the FDA. Um, and this is what we have chosen to do with acne. So we mm. uh, are currently in phase two trials uh, with the FDA. Uh, on a treatment for acne. It is not the same formulation as uh, the Mother Dirt Mist that we're selling now, um, but it's still based around this uh, this key bacteria as the core technology uh, behind the mechanism of why we think it works. Yeah, I think the subtlety there is that if you come as a grass certified classified product, you can sell as a consumer product. And then if there's medical therapeutic indications, you can turn that into an IND or a, a, a new drug. But you can't start drug and you can, if it starts off as a drug, it can never be a consumer product, which I think is an interesting subtlety from a from a entrepreneur's hat. Yeah, it's difficult. It's difficult, I think, having a dual business model either way. Right. I think right. in our case, people look at us and they think, oh, wow, like that really makes sense. But, you know, even for us, it's been it's been challenging because it's two completely different businesses how you fund each of them is is really different super different yeah i mean like yeah. as you know clinical trials for a drug is like a 10 year right. billion dollar cap x expense i mean yeah how do yeah. you think about that i mean it's basically if you, like, like yeah. how does one think about that yeah like, how do you think about that well we uh we have done all of our raises as a biotech so we have always positioned ourselves as a pharmaceutical company a pharmaceutical startup okay. to our investors which is why, you know, some people look at Mother Dirt and, and they're like, oh, well, are you raising money and what's your next round going to be? And it's kind of like we just raised $32 million, not because Mother Dirt is that big, but because we are a clinical research company um, and we are in the process of conducting multiple phase two studies and we're getting prepared to do phase three. And that is that is just how you have to fund uh, that is just how you have to fund uh, um, uh, a biotech company. You know, in our earlier days, you know, in 2014, um, where we had, I think, only to then done a Series A, so this was our Series C, um, we were trying to talk about two of the sides very distinctly. Um, and by and large, we realized that uh, we needed our message to be really centralized um, right. and that really what we were doing is we were um, a biotech company that was focused on ammonia oxidizing bacteria, and we had this consumer facing brand, but it was really all focused around the biotech side of what we were doing. And okay. we, um, you know, not to say that I'm sure that, I mean, Mother Dirt has certainly helped in that effort because <laughs> many of our investors came from finding out about the product or using it and saying, oh, right. this is awesome. But, um, you know, we just consciously made the decision that hey, let's not complicate things. We have this awesome consumer product thing going on the side, but we're not going to ask people to put a value on it. We're just going to raise money based on our clinical results mm -hmm. and our cl clinical pathway, and we're just going to keep it really simple. And if there's an upside from the consumer side, then so be it. But really, we positioned ourselves very much so as a pharmaceutical company versus a consumer product company or even a hybrid. Yeah. Interesting. So then how do you, so what is the justification then? It's like more of an education, market building, sort of a, I mean, it could, and in and of itself, could be like a big, large consumer beauty brand. Well, but the, like, I, I, so the, like, I, I'm curious how you think about that sure. from the business side. The justification is actually very simple. Uh, 
before Mother Dirt, we were doing wound healing where the market right. size is really small and the approval rate by the FDA is almost impossible. Now we have a clinical pathway that includes 10, 12 shots on goal, which is like a dream for a pharmaceutical company. And we never would have gotten there had we not had the opportunity to have thousands of people try our Absolutely. product. So it's basically like you have preclinical, a lot of traction with like yeah. consumer users. It's like, okay, there's clearly like a demand. It clearly is working on a preclinical basis. Let's, let's, let's pharmaceuticalize it. it. Yeah. 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 Okay. Interesting. Yeah. Because yeah, I know that, I mean, it sounds like you have a very interesting blend of being a, you know, a, a engineer by training, but I also noticed that, you know, you've also been a, a venture partner at an investment fund, obviously yeah. been on the business side for quite some time. I'm curious how, you know, how you sort of juxtapose those two hats. I mean, how do you, how do you, how do you see yourself as an entrepreneur, uh, huh. you know, I, so juggling these two pretty disparate sure, fields? Sure, yeah. I think um, the reason... The reason the venture partner thing came up is because I'm I'm always interested in entrepreneurs and, and figuring out how to help. I also am, I think there's, there's, unfortunately, I don't think it's spoken about enough how a lot of entrepreneurs feel like they are just figuring it out as it goes. And this is like a very normal feeling. And of course, with time, there are things that you are more familiar with, but right. treating every organization that you run or business unit that you run as like a, a templated carbon copy of one another is just is just not reality. Um, you know, right. this is not my first time trying to commercialize an idea or a concept, and each one has been so distinctly different. Sometimes it's the people, sometimes it's the nature of like the manufacturing behind it, sometimes it's the channel. Um, so, you know, I've always found myself to be, you know, doing the best that you can voraciously consuming information and choosing what works for you and your business and, and probably what doesn't and, and just like learning as quickly as I can. And I found that it's really helpful to talk to other entrepreneurs about, um, you know, their habits and routines, everything from something as seemingly benign as how do you run uh, a team meeting and an all hands thing? This was like several weeks ago where you feel like it's something that you need to do. But I went through a period where I felt like it was going through the motions and it didn't necessarily feel like a great use of time. And so I called up several of my friends who are running companies and I asked them, Hey, how do you, how do you run your, your one-on-ones? What are some awesome books that you read? How do you share learnings around stuff with your teams? And I got some really helpful and insightful advice. So the whole venture partner thing really came from being really curious about other entrepreneurs. I'm endlessly inspired by entrepreneurs and their creativity and how they view the world and how they want to change things and make them better. I will totally admit, though, that being on the investment side is so painful, and that's totally the entrepreneur in me, where it almost your feels job like is to there's say this... no most of the time, right? I mean, you right. talk to every VC, like you're saying no, probably what, like ninety, yeah, nine percent of the time. I mean, just bluntly speaking. Yeah, but th the value equation also seems really brutal. Um, you know, it, it feels like there's a very specific way in which you view value creation. And I, I understand why it has to be that way in venture capital. So, you know, we're we're, um, we're specifically talking about next gen venture partners and they have this really um, the reason I joined is because they have this sort of selective distributed venture partner network that allows entrepreneurs and former operators, which I think is really important to uh, invest in their deals. And they also have their own fund um, that they invest in deals in so that they can lead rounds and so on and so forth. Um, so the reason they really have focused uh, for a long time on having operators, former entrepreneurs, recent entrepreneurs, current entrepreneurs as their venture partners is because they've been in it. They've been in it really recently. So they totally know what's going on and they can you know, do pretty rapid assessments on not only their business and the market, but also be truly helpful. Like whether it's a really annoying issue that you're dealing with your fulfillment center on, um, or whether it's something else that's supply chain oriented or so on. And, and the so brass tacks that right, like, right, no, right. no one sees, right? Like, yeah, we, we have to, yeah. I mean, it's just like you're moving physical atoms around and you're moving trucks of stuff yeah, yeah. around the country. It's just like, where's the box? Right. We, like, well, you, like there's like s stupid stuff like that, but that's like that's like half of the battle. I know. Yeah. So you would totally, you would totally <laughs> appreciate this, but yeah. physical goods versus like virtual goods. Right. I'm sure that it's always like the grass is always greener type thing, but I've always been on the physical goods side, and and um, and uh, you know, so for people who run like internet startups, I know that it's not easy, but for some reason, I cannot help but think that it is so much easier than physical goods and physical <laughs> products because. You have to deal with 
I mean, shipping things to thousands of people on an ongoing basis and yeah, weather happens absolutely. and like, so, um, so yeah, but I think Elon, the, but I think the plus side for folks with physical products is that people are used to paying for atoms where a lot of interesting, you know, technology software companies, like people just don't want to pay for an app, even though they've dropped $5 for a coffee, which yeah. is like, isn't that interesting? That, that's like the balance. Yeah. 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 So, um, yeah, being on I'm the also interested. side is, is, yeah. uh, very different. It's very insightful. Um, but it is a, it is a different sort of hat that you need to put on. And, and I yep. was saying that the value equation is, is really brutal, but when you start to understand the business model behind funds, you understand why they need to be that way. So yeah. um, it's been a good, uh, it's been a really insightful learning experience for me. No, I think that's that's helpful context. I think a lot of starting entrepreneurs almost look at investors as this like oracle of knowledge, and and they don't realize that most you know VC funds have a business model themselves. They are a business. Yeah. They have their own LPs, their own investors, and there's certain time horizons in which they need to return capital. So, and as you were saying, um, I think having you know an ex operator or a current operator you know helping yeah. translate that i think is very helpful because i think a lot of new entrepreneurs are coming in uh they want to build an awesome product have good ideas there but just like don't necessarily understand like how some of the economics and financial engineering that goes on right. behind the scenes yeah yeah definitely definitely yeah. <laughs> i'm curious from uh you know, I'm a computer scientist by training. It's interesting yeah. for, you know, entering more and more into the IP side on biotech. It's just interesting where most tech companies in-house all their R&D, right? Like most of it's proprietary uh, yeah. industrial, you know, like Google Inc. or Facebook are publishing papers in top tier computer science journals, where it seems like very much in the case of biotech, it's always some sort of uh, academics group or university yeah. research group and, uh, commercial partners come in, acquire the IP, you know, license the IP. I mean, I'm curious what your sense is there and in helping yeah. translate to Because I know a lot of our audiences are, are Silicon Valley uh, focused necessarily. But I think, you know, but I think it's like more and more, I think Silicon Valley or, or computer science uh, operators are looking, hey, how do I, you know, we see biotech, biohacking, it's like this broad green field. How, how does one... Uh, perhaps, you know, as, as someone that's operating in the field on, on the biotech side, how yeah. to think about the IP side of things? Yeah, you know, it's really, it, it's really interesting. Uh, we, especially early on in our days, we got asked the question um, by skeptics and fairly so, hey, where are your published papers? Right. Like, I want to read your published papers. Guess what? We don't have any. Because if we did, we wouldn't be able to patent you know, whatever it is that that we're doing. And so de the development of our IP portfolio has been an important part of the value creation in this company and a huge reason that we were not able to publish a lot of papers until uh, certain uh, IP was issued. Now that we have had a, a, a um, now that we've built up our, our patent portfolios so that we feel like it is impenetrable, uh, not able to be penetrated, I should say, uh, <laughs> then, um, you know, now we are looking at how we can publish papers. Uh, we right. also have been looking at partnerships with academic institutions to really start getting our, our research out there. Um, but in the beginning, it was if it you was, could if you could share, it's like the a lot of the IP around like the types of bacteria, or, or, or if you could share some sense of sure, you know, yeah, curious. Yeah, so the the our core patent, which is uh, ammonia oxidizing bacteria for the use on skin and uh, ammonia oxidizing bacteria to be used in clothing or patches, um, that was the when we started the original lion's share of our patent portfolio. Um, and what we've tried to do is now build up our portfolio around that based on the uh, uses or applications. Um, so looking at the clinical pathways that we're pursuing and making sure that we are locked tight from a patent perspective for each of those. Uh, we have also uh, invested in uh, IP for our manufacturing. So that sounds about so, right. I mean, I, yeah. yeah. I mean, look yeah. at the space, so right? We, it's either like the molecule or I guess the bacteria and then yeah. manufacturing of said compound right. or bacteria and then use cases of I mean I think those are probably the three right broad so, areas right yeah so I mean we have had people that have jokingly said like oh I'll get a bioreactor and I'll like grow it myself and it's like go for it just <laughs> give it a go because uh, it took us a lot of money and a lot of time not only to figure yeah. out you know the scale up that you need to do and this is where it's like classical chemical engineering yeah. um, which yeah. you know wasn't even the most difficult part but it was actually figuring out the filling process 
for getting it into this bottle um, and all of the stability and the QC that happens throughout the whole process because um, you know, we say that it's a monoseptic filling process, this like oxymoron of you want it to be with bacteria in it, but just this one specific type of bacteria yeah. and no other bacteria. Right. Um, because we, if you get another microorganism in there, you don't know what the interactions are going to be. Are they going to eat um, our bacteria? Are our bacteria going to eat them? Is it, you, you just don't know. So we want to make sure that there's nothing else in it, that it's just um, uh, our ammonia oxidizing bacteria and then you need to confirm concentration. You need to confirm viability. So before these things go out, we need to make sure that the bacteria inside is actually alive. Are still alive, right. That's, so, I think, a lot of the critique around probiotic supplements, right. that most of them are dead before you eat them. So you're just eating, I don't know what you're eating, right? Like, yeah. yeah and it's good that you guys actually verify there's live culture. Yeah, and all of that takes time to figure out. And then you have the stability right. studies that you need to be that you need to be running uh, simultaneously. But our right. our IP has looked at every aspect of our business, the ones that people interact with, and also the yeah. ones that you might not think about. So being able to have a patent on the manufacturing process for something like this, or the filling process for something like this, um, is um, has been important to us. No, I, I think you're hitting a lot of like the 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 dark magic behind practicing something like this where i think a lot of people just yeah. realize oh this is just a bottle of goo like how hard is it to how make it's hard like, well, can this be? yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, then, and people realize like no like there's a lot of steps and like if you want the actual actives actually effective a lot of qc and i think um yeah no i i think that's like also like you know i think the same critique with like oh google search engine no oh, just like you type in a box like how right. hard that could that be it's like well there's like a you know, a billion supercomputers behind the scenes, like right. crunching your query, right? I think it's like that respect, I, I guess, is like more, because it's more digital, it seems like it gets more respected. But I think, yeah, filling a bottle of something is, there's, nice. there's a lot of like dark arts behind it as well. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. No, there's a, there's a funny one that we have been dealing with until very recently. Um, you know, we, um, the probably not surprisingly, actually, uh, you, you would probably know, but the interest for something like this is is quite large outside of the United States. Um, right. So international expansion has been really important to us, specifically the EU. We've had a ton of interest from the EU. I would imagine that you had said like Korean or Asian markets. I'm sure. I mean, there's a huge skincare. Yeah, yeah. Uh, maybe one day. Uh, the yeah. EU is where we're focusing for now. Uh, we've okay. had a ton of interest coming in from that. Um, so we started the registration process with the EU uh, last year. And, you know, it's really interesting. The EU has a regulation. Unlike the United States, the United States doesn't have a regulation that's quite like this. But they have a definition for a contaminated product. They very clearly define it. And it's a certain number of bacteria per CFU uh, per milliliter. So a certain number of CFU per ml. So uh, basically, if you have more than 200 colony forming units of any type of bacteria in a single ml, your product is deemed contaminated. They don't care about right. what bacteria it is. Uh, your product is, you know, contaminated and you cannot sell it. Right. Well, this was written at a time when it was never believed that bacteria would actually be the active ingredient. So right. having to work together with, uh, you know, our regulatory lawyers, both here and in the UK, and also our scientific consultancy in the UK to um, really uh, make sure that uh, we are uh, registering properly, that we are in touch with the agencies there to make sure that they understand and they uh, approve of our product has been a really interesting um, process. Uh, so to make yeah. sure that we are locked tight uh, for this. So it is, you know, you, um, and it takes a long time to be able to be able to do that. So it is, a, like yeah. you say, a dark art. It's very not sexy, but you know, it's not just, oh, just shipping a product to Europe. No, you have to follow their regulatory requirements and you have to respect the rules that they have and you have to work with, you know, your leg. Yeah, re redefining it, right? Like the, yeah, like you want over 200 CFU per ml. Otherwise, it's like, right. it's not even, doesn't you're not selling anything, right? Like, right. so it's like, it's interesting. So that's like pretty interesting. I, I guess that's like, you know, one of the main exciting things from a business side. I'm curious, as we wrap up here, what are some of the interesting avenues on the science side, if that's, is, you know, that, that you're excited about, whether that's with, you know, skin biome or just broader biohacking, broader microbiome, what are some of the interesting research there? Yeah. And then also, you know, in terms of entrepreneurs that, you know, are inspired by your story, you know, what would be the best ways to, you know, reach out and, and, and get connected there? I, and and we'll, sure. we'll wrap up on, on those two notes. Okay, great. Yeah, well, the the, the first one, uh, and we've talked about this this um, this this publicly, um, so it is okay for um, for us to share 
Um, in one of the preliminary studies that we did for acne, it was an early stage um, safety study. And as a standard part of safety, you are measuring the vitals of all of those patients in the study. And this is um, our participants spraying um, uh, different formulations of the mist on just their face uh, for, ac for acne, right? So it was a safety study to make sure that they had no adverse response. Well, there was this really interesting thing that we observed in the results that came back. Of course, it was safe, but uh, they all experienced a statistically significant dose-dependent drop in blood pressure. Hmm. So from the mechanism of the bacteria produces nitric oxide, which is a known vasodilator. So the mechanism makes sense and it's covered by our patent. So we did theoretically think that one day we could pursue something like this. What we did not expect was that the response would be, uh, that the signal would be as strong as it was for just a fairly small surface area with, uh, uh, with a small patient size. Um, so this opened up a whole new door for us, and it took us out of just being Derm and into being a sort of systemic drug company. Um, so really, really fascinating when you start to think about the microbiome, right? It really starts to get at that idea of, uh, of bugs as drugs, of uh, like really it's the, the human body is truly not as siloed as we believe it to be. You just sprayed a live bacteria on your skin, and you potentially saw a reduction in your blood pressure. I mean... That's crazy, especially when you compare it to the existing solutions for yeah. blood pressure and all the side effects that go along right. with it. Right. So we're, we're very excited about that. Uh, we're currently in phase two trials with the FDA uh, for a hypertension drug. Um, so mm. they accelerated us straight to phase two, which was also really great. Um, but that was a big that was a really big deal uh, for us and certainly an area that we're really that we're really excited about. Um, to translate that phase one is usually safety. So I presume that right. it's already safe. So it's like, okay, you can skip phase one. Right. So phase one is safety. Phase two is dosage typically. And then phase three is like full on validation. So you uh, yeah. take, yeah, you take the dosage from phase two and then you apply it to a larger population size or a larger patient size, I should say. Right. So that's one area where we're really excited on, on the research side. Um, you know, on the consumer research side, you know, there's a lot of work that we're doing in the world of biome friendly. So figuring out how we can restore certain types of bacteria to the skin is one part of the problem. The other part of it is figuring out how we can create uh, products that we use that are still friendly to this ecosystem. So we've talked for a long time about natural products and um, healthier products and non-toxic products and things like that. But no one has really talked about the effect on the ecosystem of the skin. No one has really talked about the effect on the microbiome. And what we hope to do is to introduce the microbiome as another criteria in product development and formulation. And so we have a lot of work that we're doing on that side to screen for biome-friendly ingredients and ultimately to develop additional formulas and, and hopefully start to not only expand our product offering, but hopefully share our learnings so that it can be more applied by, uh, by others. So that would be my answer to the, um, to the first question. Uh, those are, I mean, those are exciting developments. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, and then on, on the second one, I mean, it really depends on what your listeners are interested in. Um, they're more than welcome to go to aobiome.com. So that's our company's name. Uh, there you'll find most of the information on our clinical pathway and our research um, and some articles uh, that have been written about us. You're also more than welcome to Google aobiome or Mother Dirt. You'll see uh, a bunch of stuff that has come out, some of it hilarious, uh, some of it um, you know, just really, really interesting uh, how people have been talking about their experience with the product. Um, so, you know, it really depends. AO Biome or Mother Dirt. Um, all of our contact information and social media handles are um, available on the site. Um, so we'll point to those good. as well. Yeah. No, thanks so much for taking the time to share the story around the the, the forgotten or, or the missing organ or the <laughs> the organ to be further understood. Yeah. I mean, I think that's a, a super active area of research and I think you gave us some some tidbits to chew on and to do further research on. So I appreciate the time and I'm sure we'll, we'll keep tabs and, and see how these studies and, and results pan out. I think it's an exciting area for, for obviously the company, but also just all, all of humans. I mean, I think we're yeah. all figuring out how to best optimize and improve our you know, lives on a daily basis. Absolutely. Um, thanks so much for the time. I really appreciate it. I was really excited when uh, when you reached out. Um, and thank you for facilitating interesting conversations like this. I mean, this is what, what we do is all about, right? It's about having these conversations. So thank you for making it scalable. <laughs> cool.
Hey, cheers. <laughs> All right. I'll talk to you soon. All right. Take care. Bye. Bye. Are we all good? Yeah. You, you know, uh, to show you how far uh, large consumer product companies have to go, I think the budget, I, I am going to find the statistic for you, but I think their annual budget for chemical cleanup is larger than their R&D budgets. Yeah. Yeah. So it, it just goes, it goes to show how, um, I mean, what can I say? <laughs> Likewise, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Please do. Please do. And I did see that you're a tennis player. Is that true? Okay, awesome. I did too. Really? That's amazing. Yeah, I uh, I played tennis when I was younger. I played it competitively all the way up to college, and now I just do it recreationally. So I guess whenever we meet up, we'll have to make it a tennis thing. <laughs> all right, bye.